Hello, welcome to 40 Days of Easter. This is our fifth session together. Really delighted to have this opportunity to be with you. And again, we're giving Easter, Easter emphasis this year, more than just a day. We're giving 40 days. We're watching what Jesus did in the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. And this is what I believe wholeheartedly, the things that were on his heart then are still on his heart today. We have the same Jesus walking among us. He's here. He loves us. He's engaged. He cares. And man, if, if you look at these encounters that he had in the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension, you see the kind of heart he has. And it ought to encourage us fully. I'm so thankful for Jesus. Today we're going to look at his encounter with Thomas and the chapter title in 40 days of Easter is dispelling the doubt. Now, first of all, let me just start this way. I think Thomas has gotten a bad rap. How do we know Thomas? What's the word that always comes with the name Thomas? Doubting Thomas. We have for over 2000 years defined Thomas by maybe his worst day. How would you like it if that became your name, how you were referred to? Take your worst day and then attach that to your name, whatever that, whatever uh, it was that made it your worst day. We don't um, call Abraham lying Abraham, even though he lied to Pharaoh. We don't call Moses angry Moses, even though he struck the rock. We don't call David adulterer David because he committed adultery with, with Bathsheba. But Thomas... We kind of have defined him by his worst day when he doubted that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. And he's got a bad rap. In fact, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of this uh, session this morning or this afternoon, we're going to look at the fact that Thomas made one of the highest declarations of who Jesus is. You outs were um, erased away by the love of Jesus. And we're going to see Jesus uh, lovingly encounter Thomas without harsh words, uh, but with intentionality. Thomas, look at me. I'm alive. Look at, my, look at the holes where the nails were. Look at my side where the spear was. I am Jesus and I'm alive. And remember, the point of the 40 days between resurrection and ascension. The point of the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension, according to Acts chapter 1, was to give many convincing proofs that Jesus was alive. This is his intention. He doesn't want us to have doubts, and he doesn't want you to have doubts. So let me pray, and we'll jump into this. Lord, uh, all of us at some level are doubters. <laughs> Just say that again. All of us at some level are doubters. And so, Lord, we need you. We need you to encounter us just like you encountered Thomas. And Lord, would you prove yourself to us? In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, he's gotten a bad rap for over 2,000 years. Let's try to make that right a little bit. Let's look at the story. It's in John chapter 20, starting with verse 24, down through verse 31. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. We're going to look at that verse in just a minute. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. I think that's what Thomas should be known for. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
That's the purpose of the Gospel of John in that 31st verse of John chapter 20. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Well, again, man, bless the heart of Jesus, how intentional he is, that Thomas not doubt, but that he believe. The first thing that I want to draw your attention to is that in this case for Thomas, he's an outsider looking in. He wasn't with the disciples when they encountered Jesus. So he's watching all of their excitement, all of, all of their intensity, all of their just blooming faith about a resurrected Lord, and he didn't see it. He wasn't, he wasn't there. He was not a part of the in crowd that day. Thomas, at this point, is an outsider. And that's important to me because, uh, man, a lot of us who maybe participate in this study, whether it's online here or in our face-to-face -face meeting tonight at Wesley Church, a lot of us know what it's like to be outsiders. That's how we might define ourselves. We've always kind of felt that we've been on the outside looking in. You, you may feel like an outsider in your family or may have felt that when you were young. Maybe you felt like an outsider looking in. You may have felt that way. Again, I'm repeating, we're having some uh, internet. Jesus is intentional, intentional about reaching the outsider. He's going after Thomas. He knows that Thomas is doubting, and so he encounters him. I love just the imagery of the encounter. The disciples are in a locked room, and at one point, Jesus is not there, right? So the room is locked and Jesus is not in the room. But then all of a sudden, Jesus is in their midst. Again, resurrected body, eternal body. It's like ours. It's flesh and blood. He eats in front of them. He wants them to know that it's a body. He has Thomas touch him, but it's also not like ours. It's, it's another dimension. It's, it, it's created for another age not this linear existence age of start and finish. It's eternal, it's like ours and not like ours. That's important. So Jesus just appears. I've had some fun with that appearing. I don't know if this is true or not, but this is what I write in the book. I see Thomas holding court in the middle of the disciples. Listen to him. If I said it once, I'll say it again. I will not believe this resurrection story unless I see him myself. Unless I see the nail scars, inspect the wound, I just won't. Thomas stops in mid-sentence because all attention in the room is away from him and there's not a sound coming from any of the disciples. All eyes are big and focused on the same thing. Thomas becomes aware that someone else is in the room. He says, he's here, isn't he? They shake their heads. He's behind me, isn't he? They shake their heads. I don't know if it happened like that, but we do know that Jesus just appeared in their midst even though the doors were locked because of their fear. Christ's resurrection body is flesh and blood, but it is not like ours. And again, let me make this point. He encounters the outsider, the one who wasn't in, who's outside looking in. He cares about you, and he cares about you if you feel like, if you felt like an outsider most of your life. Jesus brings Thomas in. I uh, want to share this quote that I put in another book I've written called Voice from Home, The Words You Long to Hear from Your Father. It's a quote from Frederick Bickner in his book, The Longing for Home. All of us are homesick for Eden. We yearn to return to a land we've never known. Deep is the need to go back to the garden, a burning so strong for a place we belong, a place that we know is home. Listen, at some level, I think all of us feel like outsiders. And I want you to know that Jesus cares about that. And right now he cares for you. And he wants to make himself known, and he wants to prove to you not only his life, but his love. He wants to bring you in. That's the beauty of Jesus. It doesn't have to be outsiders with Jesus. He wants you in him, inside. 
So Jesus brings Thomas in and cures his doubt. And I want to also just say, listen, there's a difference between those of us who doubt and people who are unbelievers and even obstinate in their unbelief. In fact, if I won't take the time now, but look at how Jesus deals with the Pharisees' unbelief in John chapter 8. It's very harsh, very pointed, self-righteous, I mean anger over unbelief. But he doesn't deal that way with Thomas. And so I don't want you to get that confused. And, and many of us have an image of a harsh Jesus who hates doubt. No, oh, man, we have an intentional Jesus that cures doubt. That's who Jesus is. And there's a difference between a doubting disciple, which is what Thomas is, and an obstinate unbeliever which is what the Pharisees were, who ultimately saw to Jesus' death. And so I just want uh, to spend some time here in the closing moments of this intro to the study in the book and just encourage you if you're a doubter, if you have some doubts. And I want you to know Jesus goes after the outsiders and he brings you in and he cures doubt. And so I want you to think about your future. What do you believe about your future? And I want to encourage you that Jesus will give you great confidence regarding your future. We, we just saw um, uh, in a meeting this week, uh, Sunday morning, somebody gave us that scripture as a word to encourage us that we have a future with God, a hope with God. And I want you to be encouraged by this. I want you to think about the fruit of the Spirit that's available to you and, and what you're expressing and see if you're moving away from doubt because of the fruit of the Spirit. And I also want you to... You can read more about this in the book regarding the fight that's ours spiritually, that, that we continue in this fight. And that's all I want to close. I want you to look with me at... Uh, St. Paul, greatest missionary the world's ever known. And I want you to see what his life was like right at, at the very end. And I'm going to read this whole passage for you. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting with verse 9, down through the very end of that letter that Paul writes to Timothy. Paul's writing to young Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly. Remember that. Come quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. I want you to remember that. When Timothy comes, please bring my cloak, my coat, and also my books. Man, I've, I've got to have that. I want my coat and my books. Verse 14, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Aracia stayed in Corinth and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Prudence, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Man, we looked at future. He doesn't have a bright future, humanly speaking. He's arrested and will soon be martyred. Fruit, it's all over him. Man, don't hold it against them. Nobody supported me. Everyone turned their backs on me. I stood among the lions, and yet there's such fruitfulness, such love. His last words, the Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you, and the fight. This man is still fighting the fight, and I love that. I love to see that. Here's what grabs my heart about this passage. 
He's arrested. He's, man, been beaten down by ministry. Remember all the things that happened to Paul. He's close to his death. Uh, in chains. Old apostle. And he's cold. I don't know why that just grabs me. And so when I hear things like, get here quickly. And please, when, when you come, bring my coat. And then towards the end, do your best, verse 21, do your best to get here before winter. Man, this victorious man in this weakness is just saying, man, it's cold. Greatest missionary the world's ever known. Please don't forget to bring my coat and my books. I need them. And please come because everyone's deserted me. I love that his future is secure. The fruit of the Spirit is still on him. And he's still in the fight to remain faithful. When everything could have caused Paul to doubt, Jesus helped him to maintain belief. And Jesus will do the same for you because he comes to dispel the doubt. It's on his heart. It was then in the 40 days, it is now. So let him dispel your doubt in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.